and welcome to The Farming Week, the podcast from Agriland that keeps you up to date with all the latest in Irish agriculture. I'm Louise Hickey and I'm joined today by journalists Ashling O'Brien, Francis McDonnell and Rabina Freiberg. One of our most read stories this week is that sales from Monday were temporarily suspended at Athenry Marsh, County Galway. Sales have not resumed as of yet, but the chair of Athenry Marsh, Michael Francis Murphy, told Agriland that Mart staff are actively working with the Department of Agriculture to get things back on track in the next few days. Stay tuned to agriland.ie for any further updates on that. And the big story this week is that beef exports have resumed to China following high-level discussions between the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar and the Chinese Premier Li Chung. Ashling, can you remind us again about why exports originally stopped? Yeah, Louise. So there was great disappointment last year when beef shipments to China were suspended following the confirmation in November of an isolated case of atypical BSE. It was detected in a dead 10-year-old cow by the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine Surveillance Programme. The animal didn't enter the food chain or the feed chain and it posed no risk to human health. Now, atypical BSE, to, to remind listeners, occurs sporadically in all cattle populations at a very low rate and it's not considered a public health risk and it also doesn't affect Ireland's status for negligible for BSE as well. So the suspension of access to the Chinese market w- was quite unique um, in the wake of this because it is to do with the protocol that is agreed between Irish authorities and Chinese authorities when it comes to trade. So since then, the government, Minister for Agriculture, Food and the Marine, Charlie McConlogue and his department have all been working behind the scenes to restore access. And this has included um, submitting various reports to the Chinese authorities to reassure them of the robustness of our system. And I suppose the robustness of our system is demonstrated in the fact that this atypical case was detected in the first instance. So several years ago, we had a similar incident and it took two and a half years to restore the Chinese market for Irish beef exports. But the hope in this occasion was that the resumption wouldn't take as long. And this has proven to be the case because on Wednesday, uh, I believe it's the largest plane that ever landed in Dublin Airport, Louise, uh, brought the Chinese Premier Li Chang to Ireland for a meeting with Taoiseach Leo Varadkar. And they held high level discussions on a range of issues, including Irish beef exports to China. And following those talks, Talks, Minister for Agriculture Charlie McConlogue and Minister of State at the department who has responsibility for market development Martin Hayden confirmed that the Irish beef exports would be resuming to China. The minister said that the negotiation of the resumption of beef access has been a top priority for him since the temporary suspension. And uh, look, this is a market that was growing prior to the suspension. And uh, in 2023, prior to November, some 19.7 million euro worth of beef was sent over to China, according to the Central Statistics Office, some 3,200 tonnes of Irish beef. And look, this is a, a major potential market for Ireland, Louise, and you know it is being welcomed across the board. And Board Bia has said that it's going to reactivate its promotional campaign for Irish beef and lamb in the wake of the announcement. That campaign is worth around 1.6 million euro. And uh, as part of that, they're going to be inviting Irish exports over to a trade fair in China uh, in Shanghai in May. And they're also going to be hosting Irish beef information seminars in Beijing in March and again in Shanghai in May. So look, they are kicking on to try and grow that market again. And Ashling, what has the reaction to this resume and trade been like? Look, unsurprisingly, uh, a warm welcome for it, Louise. Any new market or existing market being reopened to Irish uh, exports is only a positive thing. But I suppose farm organisations in welcoming this also sounded a note of caution. Uh, The Irish Farmers Association um, said that there must be a price increase for beef farmers on the back of this announcement, you know, that they have to benefit from this as well. The new president of the IFA, Francie Gorman, uh, issuing a statement on that as well. And he said the development is welcome, but it has to be translated into a higher price for beef farmers. The Irish Creamery Milk Suppliers Association said that credit was due to the ministers and their officials as well. And Dennis Drennan, the ICMSA president, said it had taken together with the recent uptick 
uptick in beef prices, the sector could now look into 2024 with more confidence. The ICSA, the Irish Cattle and Sheep Farmers Association, echoing uh, the other farm organisations as well, welcoming the resumption of beef exports. But they said that farmers have to benefit from this announcement as well. And Edmund Graham, the Beef uh, Committee Chair of the ICSA, noted that it has been a particularly long, hard and expensive winter so far for beef farmers and the current price is not enough to cover the increased cost of production and he said that beef price needs to go to a base price of at least six euro a kg in the short term to cover the costs endured by farmers over the winter. And I suppose finally, Louise, from an industry point of view, Meat Industry Ireland have issued a statement as well, and they described the resumption of beef exports as a significant development, which would empower their member companies to enhance trade opportunities with valued customers in China. Dale Crammond, who's the director of MII, said that accessing the Chinese market has been a strategic priority for their members. And he acknowledged the work done by the government and Minister McConnell and and, uh, Minister Hayden on this as well. And he said that MII members will now focus on re-establishing contacts with customers in China with a view to recommencing trade as soon as possible. So it looks like uh, we won't have to wait very long uh, for Irish beef exports to make their way back to China, Louise. Absolutely. Thanks for that update, Ashling. Now, the Agriculture Water Quality Working Group has put forward some key recommendations in its final draft report this week. I'm joined by our journalist, Francis McDonnell, who is following up on this story. Francis, could you outline some of the recommendations set out to improve water quality? This is a group which was established last year by the Minister for Agriculture, Food and the Marine to basically come up with a series of new recommendations on how to improve water quality. The group, which includes all of the major farm organisations, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine and key industry representatives, has just reached agreement on its final draft recommendations. Now, you might wonder, Louise, why farmers should be interested in this group, where the recommendations that they will put forward shortly to the Minister will be considered considered as part of the interim review of the Nitrates Action Programme. And that programme, as we all know, has a significant impact on day-to-day farming. So what were the recommendations? Well, they they include encouraging farmers to use concentrate feed with a lower crude protein content where possible. The group has also suggested that the current concentrate 15% crude protein limit for adult bovines at grass during the summer period should be extended to all farms. Separately, the working group has also stated that it believes that a 5% cut in the chemical fertiliser nitrogen maximum allowances for those stocked at a grassland stocking rate of above 170 kg nitrogen per hectare is achievable. And of course, being a water group, it also looked at one of the big issues that we keep talking about here in the podcast, and that is slurry storage. They want one of their recommendations is that they want a 70% capital grant to be available. Now, there's lots more wide ranging recommendations, which include fertilizer, planting and, of course, inspections that will have an impact on day to day farming. And you can find out all about those at our app or on agriland.ie. And Francis, another story that you followed up on was about an Irish man who died in Australia and did not intend to revoke his Irish will. James Brown wanted his home place in County Mayo to go to his only son, but there were a few legal issues in getting that to happen. Francis, what was the problem and what has been the outcome of the judgment? This is a story which will sound very familiar to many people. A father with a passion for farming who wants his only son to inherit the home place, but then there's a potential legal issue. What happened in this case centred around James Brown, who had left Ireland as a young man, first for England and then Australia, and built up a very successful plant and machinery hire business in Australia. But when James Brown died aged 75, he had two wills, an Irish will and an Australian will. And in the case of the Irish will, he had left the home place in County Mayo, including 320 acres of mountain land in Ballycastle, to his only son. In her judgment, the High Court Judge Justice Chiffon Stack detailed how Brown's first love was farming and how he had involved his only son from an early age in farming when they were back in Ireland. This included rounding up cattle for testing, making silage and from time to time spending the day on the ball cutting turf with his cousin. James Brown made his Irish will in Ballina and County Mayo in October 2000, but then he made an Australian will in 2004. 
The issue of Brown's Irish will came before the High Court in Dublin following an application by the executor of the will to admit it to probate. The probate application came before the High Court because Brown's Australian will contained a clause which could, on the face of it, have revoked the Irish will. If the Irish will had been revoked, it would mean that Brown's only son would not inherit the Mayo lands or any other Irish assets. According to the judgment in this case, Brown had a very strong and specific connection to the lands in Bally Castle in County Mayo, where he had grown up. The judge had noted that his grandfather had been reared there and the family connection with the lands went back many generations. And Justice Stack noted there was no such evidence to suggest that Brown's intentions for his Irish estate had changed, despite his Australian will. The judge said in her view that it was clear that Brown had always intended for the lands of Mayo to go to his his son and that she would admit the Irish will to probe it. And I imagine that James Brown, who is buried in County Mayo, would be very happy with that decision. We also covered issues with succession and wills this week, which was mentioned in the Irish Farm Report 2024, published by IFAC this week. I'm joined now by journalist Rabina Freiberg to discuss the report. Rabina, I know there's a lot of detail in the report, but what were some of the main findings highlighted? Indeed, Louise. IFAC's latest Irish Farm Report for 2024 shows that the number of farmers who are unsure about their future continues to rise, with input prices still the biggest concern for most farmers. Now, this trend is in line with figures which show that the number of farmers who plan to be farming in five years' time continues to decline and is now 16% lower than in 2021. Particularly, the number of tillage farmers who are unsure about their future has increased significantly, now standing at 34%, while 11% of surveyed tillage farmers even said they will not be farming in five years. Another key concern for farmers identified in IFX report is succession, with over 90% of farmers saying they still believe there are significant challenges to succession planning the most significant being farm viability. Just under half of Irish farm families are yet to identify a successor, with 15% of farmers saying that there is a lack of interest from the next generation and 17% saying that the farming lifestyle does not appeal to the next generation. The report also highlights the importance of cash flow management, as latest figures show that one in three farmers in Ireland do not know if they have enough cash to pay the bills for the next six months. IFAC also said that one in four farmers do not prepare budgets or forecasts. Thanks, Rubina. Now, there have been some new milk prices announced this week. Dairy Gold confirmed that it will increase its quoted milk price by 1.5 cent a litre to 37 cent a litre for December milk. Kerry Group confirmed that the processor will pay 36 cent per litre, up one cent per litre from last month. And on Kerry Group this week, Kerry agribusiness drivers and representatives from SIP do commence strike action at the Kerry Group headquarters in Tralee. Ashling, what is the latest there? Yes, Louise. So as you said, this dispute involves five Kerry agribusiness drivers who began their strike action outside Kerry Group headquarters in Tralee on Wednesday. The drivers, as you said, they were joined on the picket line by representatives from their union, SIP2. And they've said that the industrial action centres on the company's decision to impose compulsory redundancies on them. Now, the drivers have between 29 and 45 years service with the company. Company, and they say it's the first time that they have been forced to accept compulsory redundancy. It was always on a voluntary basis in the past. And there are about 100 SIP2 members in Kerry Agri Business, which of course is part of the wider Kerry Group PLC. Now, the driver said that taking strike action was the last straw and that they had reluctantly taken to the picket line this week. And in a statement issued on Tuesday evening, Kerry Agribusiness said that following a comprehensive review of its milk collection procedures in 2023, it made the decision to transition all remaining milk collection operations to its existing independent hauliers. Subsequently, the company entered into a transparent redundancy 
Committee consultation period, they said, and began detailed discussions with the six remaining drivers in November 2023. So the employment of those drivers then terminated on December 31st without mutual agreement between the parties involved, the company said. So the drivers say the strike, which kicked off on Wednesday morning at nine o'clock and it ran until that evening, will continue until the matter is resolved. Now, Doni Foley it has been driving milk trucks for Kerry Agri Business for over three decades, Louise, and he explained to us why the drivers decided to take to the picket line. We're here with drivers that are from 29 to 45 years service with the company and this is our first time forcing compulsory redundancy on us. So it's always on a voluntary basis in the past. Right? So we're here on that basis this morning, so we're hoping to achieve to get our jobs back or, or even get into discussions with the company. We've had two meetings. They, they said we had a 30-day consultation period. We're here for the long haul and we're here to get results and to get fair play and to get justice for, for the men that are driving these trucks that have been out from early morning until late evenings. And we've actually a lot of hours put into this company over the years of service. So. So that is Doni Foley there, one of the drivers involved in the strike action, which entered a second day today, Thursday. The drivers were joined uh, on the picket line today by Greg Ennis, who is the incoming Deputy General Secretary of SIP2. And he said that the five drivers were members who had given their working life to Kerry Group. They were five excellent employees who had been treated despicably by the company, in his words. And he also said that they could not accept the outsourcing of work to independent hauliers by the company. And they said that their view and their goal here is to re-engage with the company with a view to getting those drivers reinstated. Now, as we're recording here uh, on the podcast today, Louise, the union and the drivers are yet to hear anything from the company and both have reiterated their willingness to re-engage in talks with Kerry uh, Agribusiness, Kerry Group, I suppose, in a bid to resolve this dispute. So we'll see where it goes and we'll keep you up to date on Agriland. Now, the issue surrounding VAT refunds to unregistered farmers is ongoing. Revenue stated that there is no change in regulations, but farmers are continuing to experience not receiving VAT back for certain items where they previously would have. Ashling, what's the latest there? Are revenue engaging with farmers in any way? Well, two developments, separate developments this week on this story, Louise. Firstly, Revenue has been invited to appear before the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Agriculture, Food and the Marine to discuss the issue of VAT refunds for unregistered farmers. Fine Gael Senator Tim Lombard, who's a member of that committee, told Agriland that he's actually been inundated with calls from farmers, the agribusiness sector and from banks as well about this issue. Now, although there hasn't been any major change to the legislation in this area. Senator Lombard said that a change in the interpretation by revenue has caused major confusion in the agricultural sector about what can be reclaimed. And as a result, he said farm projects around the country are being paused. And of course, that's not a good thing for anybody, Louise, especially as we've climate targets to hit and water quality standards to reach as well. So some farmers who don't receive milk checks perhaps in January or February may have held back on VAT receipts for cash flow purposes and the senator said they're now left in a scenario where they're really caught for cash because they don't know whether or not that their VAT reclaim might go through. So this week, the committee, following a request from Senator Lombard, agreed to write to Revenue to ask them if they will appear before the committee. The senator said that farmers are generally concerned and confused about what this updated interpretation means for them. And he said that clarity has to be brought forward by Revenue and he said it has to come sooner rather than later. And uh, he's hopeful that Revenue will respond to that request uh, very soon uh, to come before the committee Separately, but not totally unconnected, Fianna Fáil TD and chairperson of the Oireachtas Agriculture Committee, Jackie Cahill, has called on the Minister of Finance, Michael McGrath, to amend the legislation for VAT rebates. 
The Tipperary TD has tabled a motion for discussion on the issue of unregistered farmers not receiving VAT refunds for the Fianna Fáil Parliamentary Party meeting, which is due to be held next week. Deputy Cahill said that the call is to amend the relevant legislation to make it clear to the revenue commissioners that the original interpretation of the law governing VAT rebates should still be followed. He said that revenue had followed one single interpretation of how VAT for unregistered farmers operated for over 50 years and he appreciated the independence of revenue but he said such a drastic change in interpretation of existing legislation is tantamount in his view to an entire policy change and he said that responsibility lies with government. So we'll have to see where that goes uh, both the Oireachtas Committee invitation and also what the Fianna Fáil Parliamentary Party uh, will decide on that motion from Deputy Jackie Cattle. Thanks Ashling. Now before we go, just a reminder that soil sampling will begin on farms nationwide this week. The Department of Agriculture has contracted the Irish Soil Export Consortium that will see approximately 90,000 soil samples taken and analysed over the course of 2024. I'm afraid that's all we have time for on this week's episode of The Farming Week. Please don't forget to rate, review and follow The Farming Week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love if you could spare some time to give us five stars or share it to anyone who you think might be interested. All the best for the week ahead from myself, Ashling, Rabina and Francis.